I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Well, that's great to hear. We are in Jonah, looking at Jonah chapter 2, salvation is of the Lord. So if you have a Bible, please turn to that. If you don't have a Bible, there's one right there in front of you, or turn in your gadget to Jonah chapter 2. We've come today to look at the salvation is of the Lord, a record of how the Lord delivered Jonah from a deserving death. This is what Jonah had come to believe, that salvation is of the Lord. He believed that he was cast away from the sight of the Lord because of his disobedience and was good as dead. But in chapter 2, we will see that he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord answered him. It's a wonderful, wonderful psalm, the psalm of Jonah. I'll ask for your forgiveness ahead of time, because uh, as I was sharing this message with my wife, I realized I kept on calling it the psalm of David, because it's a psalm, and you don't, it doesn't, it's like, kind of like out of place. But it is, a, it is the psalm of Jonah, quite like many of the psalms that we read of David. And as I was studying and preparing for this, I was thinking about you and thinking about my own life, and I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey. I don't know if you're a like Jonah in a sense that you are running from the Lord. And perhaps you've gotten to a place in your life where you realize that there's nowhere else to run. Like Jonah, you give up and you look up to the Lord and you turn to the Lord. And that is where you will find hope. That is where you will find the mercy of God. And I don't know if that's your situation this morning, but it's not, nothing to be ashamed of. We all have a journey. We all have to find our way and I can relate to this story that we'll be reading in a moment, so much so, I can actually say that it is a story of my life, probably not, obviously not to the degree that it was of Jonah, as we'll read in a moment, but I was running from the Lord. I was running from the Lord. I didn't know that I was running from the Lord because I was a sinner, and sinners don't really know that they're running from the Lord. Sinners don't really know that they're lost, that they're blind, that they're dead, that they're selfish, clueless as to their situation and their predicament before God. They've messed their life up, and they get to the bottom of their rope, so to speak. And that's what happens here with Jonah, and he reaches out to the Lord, and I reached out to the Lord, and the Lord saved me. Salvation is of the Lord. And that is what we'll learn today from this chapter in Jonah. So let me read it to you and ask the Lord to help us apply this to our life. Hear from the word of the Lord. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Notice I'm reading 117. That is, in my understanding, a part of chapter 2. 
Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Again, he says, the waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the mooring or the roots of the mountains. The earth was with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. In verse 8 and following is what Jonah learned from this whole situation. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Father, I pray that you would give us that which we need. I'm in great need, Lord, to teach your people. They are in great need to hear and to hear well and apply to their life what they hear. And so I pray to that endeavor, I pray, God, that you will be glorified in this time together in worshiping you, in the hearing and the responding of the word of God. To you we look in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I need to do something before we get into this actual chapter. There's a couple of things, actually. First, I need to recount where we are in the story. Most of you probably have a general understanding of what has happened so far, but some of you might not know. As we've learned so far, Jonah is a prophet sent from the Lord He was told in chapter 1 to go to Nineveh and to cry out and to preach to that country judgment. But Jonah knew differently. He understood differently. He had a different take on things, and he did not agree with the Lord's plan, and he decided to rebel against the Lord. We know that Jonah is going to attempt to flee from the presence of the Lord, and this is a feeble attempt. You and I can sit back and look at it and read it and say, wow, this is foolish for a person to try to run from the presence of the Lord because we all know that the Lord is everywhere. You cannot run from the Lord. But I believe and think about this, that Jonah believes, does not believe he can actually flee from the Lord, but this is what sin does to an individual. Sin causes us to think in a way that we ought not to think. It blinds us. It hardens us. It tells us lies. It tells us that God is wrong and we are right and He's given us too much to handle and so we reason within ourselves and we say, I can do this or I can do that and though we know we're not thinking right, at that time we don't realize it. We are in a state of rebellion And it's only going to get worse unless we come to our senses. But we see, furthermore, that Jonah gets into a boat. He goes down into Joppa, down to the ship, down so he can go from the presence of the Lord. And it's emphasizing over and over again this downward spiral of Jonah's decision to go from the presence of the Lord. And that's what sin does. Sin brings you and I down, not up, down from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord, as we see here, is pursuing Jonah. He's not letting Jonah just walk away. 
just like he does for you and just like he does for me. God pursues us even when we don't deserve to be pursued. God loves us and he pursues us and he sends a great storm. Notice it is the Lord who sent this storm. It is not Mother Nature. It is not something that happened by chance, but it is the Lord. Because God wants us to see from Jonah that he is sovereign over everything. He is the one in control. The storm is sent to awaken Jonah from his sleep. Startle him and to wake him up. And when, when, when the prayers of the crew proved useless, then they go and waken Jonah from his sleep. They cast lots to find out who's at fault. And the lot, it says, falls to Jonah. And then Jonah says in verse 9 of chapter 1, when they asked him who he was and what he was doing, they fired a bunch of questions at him. He says, I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. That brought great fear upon the sailors. And the crew asked him, what might they do to still this storm? Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then the storm will become calm for you. They didn't like that answer. And so they tried even harder to save themselves, as we learned last Sunday. But they could not. The crew, therefore, threw him overboard. And as soon as they throw Jonah overboard, the storm ceased. And Jonah begins to sink in the water. And what happens? Well, we've been told in Sunday school. Maybe you look at it too. You look at this and the, it seems immediately, as soon as he hit the water, that the Lord prepared a fish, a great one. Not a whale, by the way. A great fish, it says. No one knows what kind of fish it was. And that fish swallowed up Jonah right away. And then this prayer that it says that he prayed in the belly of the fish is all his, of what he's going through while he's in this fish. But I want to submit to you this morning that is not how the story goes. Jonah is actually going to cry out as he is going to the bottom of that sea. And then he cries out to the Lord. And then the Lord provides the fish to rescue him. We will see that as we look closer at this passage that we're looking at this morning. Chapter 2 is what Jonah prayed while still conscious in the fish. He's going to recount his cry of distress in the water and lifts a voice of thanks for the deliverance that he, ex that he got from the Lord. And so as we... Begin to look at this prayer of Jonah. Before I do that, I want to talk about an elephant that's in the room. There's an elephant in the room. I know you don't see it, but there is. Because as you look at here, it says that now Jonah, I'm sorry, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Any skeptics in the house? I'm sure there's a few of you here. I'm a little skeptical myself. Look at that, and I say that's possible. Can a man survive, not just for a moment, not just for a day, but for three days and three nights? There he is in the belly of the fish, and he survives, and the Lord spits him out onto dry land. This is hard for people to believe. Christians, I would believe, even struggle. In my flesh, I struggle with believing this. But I want to tell you that why we believe this. We believe this not just because it says it right here. That's a good reason. I believe this is God's word. But we believe this to be a historical fact that it actually took place and not a fable that has been passed on to us. We believe it because Jesus told us that this is a true story. Jesus told us. In fact, Jesus sees himself as a type of Jonah. In Matthew chapter 12 the Jews would not believe in Jesus that he was the Messiah unless he gave them a sign. Give us a sign and we will believe. And he says to them, that the only sign I'm going to give to you, at this point he's already given them a number of different signs, and they still would not believe. They had a hardened heart, and in fact they wanted to kill Jesus. He had given them variable evidences of who he was, yet they still didn't believe. 
He says, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Look at verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and, and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is pointing out the historical truthfulness of this prophet and this story that we're looking at as of Jonah. First, he tells us that just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the grave for three days and three nights. So if you believe that Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights, Jesus is saying, just as you believe that, you ought to believe that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. Not only that, Jesus is saying that a greater prophet is among you, that when Jonah preached to the Ninevites, they repented, and we'll see that in chapter 3. They repented, but, a, but someone greater is among you. And you still won't believe. This is the only sign you're going to see, he says. And so those of us who respect the wisdom of Jesus will be very slow to call his judgment into question. He thought this story was historical. You and I ought to think the same way. And so if you ask, can a man survive in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights? The answer is he probably can't. He probably can't any more than a person can be dead in a grave for three days and three nights and then miraculously rise back to life out of that grave. That is why Jesus calls it a sign. And then in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, he says this, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign and yet no sign shall be given to it but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. Jesus knew that this was no ordinary event. It was a miraculous sign of God's gracious and powerful intervention. There is no point, therefore, in trying to explain it scientifically any more than the miraculous signs of Jesus' ministry. It's just that, a miracle. Just as God, we believe, can perform a miracle anytime He chooses, God can perform a miracle here. And so Jonah cries for help, and God saves him miraculously with a fish. And so we believe this to be true because Jesus used it as an illustration of him being in the grave for three days and three nights. It is a true historical account. So the elephant out of the room has been taken. He's gone back to the zoo where he belongs. All right? Now, I think we can assume since Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, it says... That while he was, he was conscious at some times, as we know, Jonah likes to sleep, right? So he probably fell asleep a few times while he was in the belly of the fish. He was awake long enough to realize that it was the Lord. It was the Lord who had saved him from drowning in the sea. And so Jonah prays, it says, from the belly of the fish. And I want to point out to you why I believe that he actually cried out for deliverance while he was in the water, and then God saved him the fish, the great fish. The language of this text reveals past time events. Look at the text. He says, I cried out. He answered me. Again, I cried and you heard my voice. It's much clearer in the Hebrew text and what, what, which tells us that Jonah is recalling what happened to him in the water, not in the fish. Jonah is referring to the distress of the past, the time he spent in the water, not the time he spent in the fish. And why is this important? As we'll read when we get further into this psalm, the writer wants us to understand that the water is the threat of death. The fish is the refuge of salvation. The cry of distress is past tense. He's in the water crying out to the Lord And the voice of confidence and and thanks is present while he's in the fish. He thanks the Lord for saving him. And so as we look at this in particular, 
I want us to learn some things from this prayer. In verse 2, he says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me. It's a simple thing there. But in this simple statement, it sums up something that I think is very encouraging to you and to me. As Jonah sank in the water, he cried out to God. And God answered him by sending a fish to save him. There's a lot of encouragement for us to see here. And the general point that I want us to understand is that God hears your prayers. God hears your prayers. He hears the prayers of his children when they cry out to him in their distress. The scriptures are filled with this over and over again in the Psalms. You will read the same type of wording. I cried out to the Lord because I was in distress and the Lord heard me, and the Lord answered me, and the Lord delivered me, and the Lord came to me. You, as a child of God, can have that kind of confidence that the Lord will always answer you. He will always answer us. Now listen, in saying that, I want you to understand something. You and I might not like the answer that God gives us. Did you hear that? You and I might not like the answer that God gives to us. But God always answers that prayer when we are in distress and we are in a crisis mode. But sometimes we don't like the answer and we want a different answer. But that's not how the Lord works. Listen to this story from Donald Gray Barnhouse. With the Lord right now, he's a pastor years and years ago of 10th Presbyterian Church. He gave it a story of, a, of an occasion he had with his little daughter. His daughter, had come, his daughter had come to him with a request that he had denied. He already said no. Well then, what do you want me to do, she asked. He told her what he wanted and then went on with his work. She remained there standing with her arms folded, staring at her daddy. Time had gone by at length. Mrs. Barnhouse called out to her daughter from another room. Where are you and what are you doing? And her daughter replied, I'm waiting for daddy to tell me what he wants me to do. At this point, Dr. Barnhouse stopped what he was doing. He raised his head and said to her, whatever you are doing, you are not waiting to find out what I want you to do. I've already told you what I want you to do, but you do not like it. You are actually waiting to see if you can get me to change my mind. I think you and I can relate to that. Let's say you and I are in some kind of crisis situation, a distressful situation. Things are not going good for us. Perhaps most of the time it is because of our own foolish choices that we make. And we ask the Lord to deliver us. We ask the Lord to help us and he answers us. And what does he do? He brings to our mind what it is he wants us to do. He provides a way of escape, as he always does. He promises. And because the answer that he gives is not something that we like, because perhaps God is touching on something, knocking on the door, that door you don't want him to go through, touching on an idol that is in our hearts that we don't want to give up. We want a different answer, but he's already given the answer to us, but we want a different one. And we're like that little girl just sitting there with our arms folded, waiting for a different answer, and the God's not going to give us. He doesn't work that way. He's already given the answer to us. And I, as I was studying this psalm, as I read verse 8, I can see something here that needs to be applied to our lives. Look at verse 8. This is what Jonah learned from this whole experience. That those who regard or embrace worthless or empty idols forsake their own mercy. And this is what I believe the Lord has put this verse here for, for us to understand. That those who embrace or regard idols of the heart, instead of following the Lord's will, what happens? Well, We miss out on the Lord's best. We miss out on the Lord's best. We miss out on experience the Lord's steadfast love. 
You see, the Lord allows us to wallow in our own miseries, even experience devastating consequences for the foolish choices that we make, all to get us to see. It's pointing out something in our life, an idol of our hearts that we don't want to turn from. And if we don't turn from it, we will not experience what Jonah says that he's or now he's experienced. Those who regard or embrace worthless idols forsake their own mercy. God's offering mercy. God offers the answer. God offers the help. But we hold on to something he's pointing out. That's what I want you to deal with. That's what I want you to turn from. That's what I want you to repent from. And we're like, no, I like it. It's mine. It's my desire, my will. I want to do it. God's saying no. And it took a near-death experience for Jonah to come to his senses, just like it did in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son. It, it, he had to come to the end of his rope for him to see, ah, it's not worth it, and he turned, right? God wants us to come to the end of ourself. I hope it doesn't come to that for you and I today. And so let's talk about this. What idol do you have, you, you and I have in our hearts that we're not willing to get rid of, that's caused all the trouble in your life and in my life. And we're crying out to the Lord for help, but he's not giving the answer that you and I want. Just like he says to Israel in Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and yewned themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. No water, excuse me. This picture here, but the Lord wants us to see him. The Lord wants us to see him as a fountain of living water. He's the one that should be satisfying all of our needs. He's our God. He's the one that should be making us happy. He's the one that should satisfy our deepest longings. And just like Israel replaces that with something else, you and I could be guilty of the same thing. And God is pointing that out in our life. So what should the Lord be to us? He should be a fountain of living water, but we replace it with something that can't even hold water. What is an idol? An idol is something that replaces the Lord in our life. An idol is anything that we look to instead of God as living water, and they are hidden, sometimes deeply within our hearts. Tim Keller defines an idol as our idols are those things we count on to give our life meaning. They are the things of which we say, catch this, I need this to make me happy. This could be a job, could be a pursuit of a career, it could be a person. It could be the, even the thought of marriage, a desire to be, and whatever it is. I need this to make me happy, and if I don't have it, I'm never going to be satisfied. And if I don't have this, my life is worthless and meaningless. That's an idol. God is the one who should be in that place. And so the Lord is pointing out to us this morning. He does answer all of our prayers. And sometimes He gives us an answer that we don't like to hear, and He's pointing out something in our life because we've embraced an idol. We won't let go of it. Is the Lord trying to rescue you this morning? But he's waiting for you to see the idol that's in your heart and to turn from it. You're clinging to it, but you don't want to let go of it. Today could be the day that you experience the steadfast love of the Lord in a way that you've never experienced it before, as Jonah did. He remembered, he looked up to the Lord, and the Lord saved him. The encouraging thing is that the Lord does answer all of our prayers. And so, in the rest of this psalm, You'll see the language. Here is Jonah in the sea, going to the bottom. Look at the language. You, you cast me into the deep, from, from into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and, all your, and your waves passed over me, and I said, I've been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. How far did Jonah go down? He says, I went down to the mooring of the mountains. That is, to the roots of the mountains, the bottom of the sea. 
And then he says, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up. My, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. And so picture Jonah. Cast off the ship, going to the bottom of the sea, all the way to the bottom. Ready to die. He even says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Jonah feels he's as good as dead. Seaweed is wrapped around his head. He's strangled by it. He's getting further and further. And he vivid illustration of him getting to the point where he's as good as dead. And what does he do? Twice he says, I looked up to your holy temple. I cried out to you, Lord. And so the Lord allowed him, catch this, to get all the way to the bottom because Jonah still was holding on to his idols. He would not let go. And he got all the way to the bottom, and that was it. He gave up. And he cried out to the Lord in his distress. And then the Lord answered him. And then the Lord sent this great fish to rescue Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. The fish saved him. The water was killing him. You see it? What do we learn from this wonderful, beautiful psalm? First of all, in verse 3, Jonah is not blaming the sailors for throwing him in the water. Lord, you cast me into the deep. Salvation is of the Lord. You're the one that is in control of my life. This is honesty. I am looking to you. This is all I know you're doing because of I've, I've turned from you. And then look at Jonah's words in verse 4. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Jonah feels as though God abandoned him. But who abandoned who? It was Jonah who abandoned the Lord. It was Jonah who turned his back on the Lord. God never abandoned him. As a matter of fact, God's watching him. God's waiting for him. And he comes to his senses and God rescues him. The Lord never, ever abandoned him. And you and I can get like this in our life. We think the Lord abandoned us. We've, we've messed up. We've sinned. We're not faithful to the Lord and we go our own way. And we get so far in our situation, we feel the Lord's abandoned us. He's forgotten about us. I want to encourage you this morning as I bring this message to a close. If you are a child of God here this morning, the Lord will never abandon you. You might feel like you've been abandoned because of your own doing. God loves you. God cares about you. God is watching you. He's waiting for you to get like Jonah did and cry out to the Lord in your distress. and He will rescue you. Turn from whatever idol you're holding on to. God will never abandon you. Never, never forsake you. Romans 8, 35 through 39 is the promise that God gives to every believer. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you, but you've never turned from your sins and trusted Jesus to be your Savior, that's the first predicament you need to deal with. This promise that I'm about to read from Romans 8, 35 and 39, through 39, is a promise that not, God doesn't give it to every person. He gives it to all those who are in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ because you've turned from your sin, you've embraced him as your Lord and Savior, he's forgiven you. This promise is for you no matter how you feel today. Don't live your life by your feelings. Live your life by the truth of God's word. Amen? Look at the promise. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? That's death. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. This is, these are words to a believer. See what's happening to the believers in the first century church here? Yet in all things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? That is God's promise to you as a believer. So no matter how you feel, God has not abandoned you. You might have abandoned the Lord, and you're, not, you're running from God. Turn to the Lord, and you will experience this wonderful, wonderful blessing of God's steadfast love. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And then Jonah goes on. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So Jonah had to learn. Jonah had to learn that, that these idols he was holding on to was, was causing him to forsake the Lord's mercy in his life. To turn to the Lord. When true humility, turning from whatever idol it was, we don't even know what it was, but I think you and I know what idols we have in our own hearts. God shows them to us. Turn from it. And then look at these last words. I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, we'll look at this again next, next Sunday, but I want to point out something to you. Just like the sailors, after they were saved, delivered from sure death, they threw Jonah off the boat, right? It says there in the end of, verse of chapter 1, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Here's Jonah. I will pay what I have vowed. He gave a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and he says, I will pay what I have vowed. These vows have something to do with service. Jonah was called by the Lord to be a prophet, to obey the Lord and go to Nineveh and preach the judgment message that God gave to him. Jonah wouldn't do that. You and I today are not Jonah in that sense, but we are called by the Lord to serve him. If you are here this morning and, you've been, and you are saved, you are saved to serve the Lord. And it's kind of like when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you enter into a vow that my life belongs to you and you belong to me, Right? And now that I'm saved, I'm not saved just to go to heaven and enjoy that or even to enjoy what I got now, but I am saved to serve you. Do you realize that, why God saved you? God saved you, not so you can just live selfishly for yourself, but he saved you and I so that we would serve him. We are saved to serve. This is what Jonah means. I will, fors I will not forsake your mercy anymore. I will turn from the idols that are controlling my life. And I will serve you. I will bring the message to the Ninevites as you've commanded, for I am your servant. So question, as we end in a moment in prayer and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, have you come to a place in your spiritual journey with the Lord that you are doing what you know He wants you to do? You are serving the Lord. And if you don't have peace in answering that question, this morning, today, realize that salvation is of the Lord. It's not your decision what you do with your salvation. It is of the Lord. You need to serve the Lord. It's God's call upon every believer's life. Have you come to a place in your journey with the Lord that you're doing exactly what you believe He wants you to do? If not, today, Today, run no more. Run to him and say, I want to do what you want me to do. And if you don't know what that is, you need to come and talk to me or Pete. We'll give you, we'll give you a, le some, a list of things that you can try out and start serving and see where the Lord wants you to serve. Are you running from the Lord this morning? Have you come to a place in your life that you now realize that it's time to surrender? Stop running. Stop running from the Lord. Run to the Lord. Surrender your life to the Lord. Stop forsaking the mercy that God has for you. And finally, don't be like Jonah. Don't be like Jonah and run from the Lord, but be like Jonah and run to the Lord. Amen? As I close in prayer... We're going to have the Lord's Supper. So as I'm praying, 
the men will come up and help prepare for the Lord's Supper. Please bow your heads and have the men come forward, please. Lord, we come to you and we pray that even though we hear people walking around us, that we would still prepare our hearts to, to minister to you, for you to minister to us. I pray, Lord, that as we prepare our hearts for partaking of the Lord's Supper, that it will be a time of inward perspective, that we are examining our hearts before you. Perhaps there's someone here today, Lord, that you've told them, you've pointed out to them, you've told them that they are lost, that they are surrounded by the waters of sin. And sooner or later, sin is going to have its full effect with death. Because the punishment, the wages of sin is death. Oh God, I pray for that person today that they will realize that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. May they turn to Jesus for salvation. And may all of us prepare our hearts. No longer run, but surrender to your will. Oh, the way of the transgressor is hard. God, you always win. May we surrender to your will in every area of our life. Every door is open. Come and look. My heart belongs to you. You are my, my God. I have no idols that take your place. You give me happiness. You make my life meaningful. You are my greatest satisfaction, the treasure of my life. Help us, oh God. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to be silent for a moment and let us all just pray. And ask the Lord to search us, try us, see if there'll be any wicked way or any way in our life that is something that we don't know about. May the, may the Lord reveal it to us so we can confess it he is faithful and just to forgive us if we confess. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for the salvation you've provided on the cross. And now... We gather together as one, one body to celebrate our forgiveness, to look forward to the day you return. We do this in remembrance of you. We remember what you've done for us as we celebrate our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen. Just a few words of uh, reminder. This morning, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is for God's people. And so if you're here this morning and Jesus is your Savior, you are invited to partake. There'll be a, a plate coming by you in a moment that's got some crackers in it that represents the body of Christ. There'll be cups that'll be coming to you that will represent the cup of the, of the, of the new covenant, the blood that was shed for us. They're not really what it is, but it's symbols of it. And they're reminding us what Jesus has done for us. And so we partake together as a church. So you'll get some. It'll be given to you. Wait for the whole body to get theirs. And then I'll, we'll pray and all, all partake together. And so may the Lord have, um, may the Lord be glorified as we partake of this and so we may serve God's people.
ask Brother Mark to uh, pray for us. I'll read the passage and we'll partake of that. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you. I was lost, but now I am found. I was dead, but you've made me alive. Your sacrifice paid the price for all of my sins. And all of us here this morning who have called out to you and trusted you to be their Savior is because of you. Your sacrifice made us acceptable to your Father in heaven. Now he's our Father. We thank you for that. Be glorified, Jesus. Be glorified in our lives. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.
Jesus, we offer this as a sacrifice, an offering. Your blood was shed for us. Your blood didn't cover our sins. Your blood washed us from our sins. You voluntarily gave up your life for our sins. And that offering is for us. And you draw us closer to you. Like a man bringing us to the Lord. It's unimaginable. It's wonderful. And so as my brothers and sisters here, Lord, as we call this name, Right now, that we would all be drawn closer to you, that our lives would be a reflection of what you want them to be right now. Father, please compel us to love you more. Thank you. Amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for this re time of remembrance, this time of celebration, this time of recognizing your power and your glory and your majesty and your uh, kindness and love toward us. That You loved us so much that you hung on a cross for six long hours and you took the punishment that we deserved for our sins. Thank you, God, for this moment of reflecting upon that in a, in a visible way for all to see. You've instituted this, Lord. We might not understand all the details and all the ramifications of it, but you have commanded us to do this, and so we do it unto you out of obedience, realizing that you're the one in control, and we love you and we praise you. We ask you to bless us, Lord, as your church, that we would live our lives for you, that you would be pleased. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I don't have a bulletin, so I forgot what goes next. Is it the song or is it collection? Song? Okay, if it's there. Right, I'd like to invite everybody to stand and sing Build My Life with us. Um, this is a new song, so I'm going to sing the bridge and the verse first. And then you guys can come and join in on the bridge, and, the, and then we'll go into the verse because it's the easiest part of the song. Worthy of all the praise we could ever be. 